1939 to 1945. It was fought primarily in Europe and the South Pacific. Yet Chicago was at the center of the fight, and so were her people. I'm Bill Cullerton, and I'm 74 years old. Uh, my name is Bob E. Moan, and I'm 75 years old. Yolanda Hall, 75 years old this year. <laughs> Dempsey J. Travis, age 77. My name is William R. Thompson. I am 81 years of age. My name is Mario Mazzanelli. I'm 81 years old and going strong. Jack Hughes, used to be called John Kelly Hughes, I'm 82. My name is uh, Studs Turkle, 85, born near the Titanic sank. My name is Margaret Hine Abramson. I was 86 in February. This is a story of Chicago during the period some called the Good War. It is told by the people who lived it. Dr. Perry Dewis is an historian at the University of Illinois, Chicago. He is co-author of the acclaimed book, We've Got a Job to Do, Chicagoans and World War II. The story starts a few years before. Chicago had had a very difficult decade with the, the uh, Great Depression. I was at DePaul University. I started in, in 1929. I graduated in 33. But I did take courses in social work because I knew there was no jobs in the business world. Mom and Grandma, they had a house at 84th and Morgan, and they, times were tough, and they didn't want to lose the house. Nobody had nothing. Everybody pitched in with each other. We really don't know exactly what the unemployment rate was because people had stopped searching for work. But a lot of that had started to turn around about 1938, 39. But just as Chicagoans were beginning to feel secure again, war clouds were gathering. Hitler was moving across Europe, and there was growing apprehension in the Far East. On October 5, 1937, President Franklin Roosevelt came to Chicago to dedicate the Outer Drive Bridge. Thousands listened as he warned that the spread of Japanese imperialism might have to be checked by other nations. I have been compelled to contrast our peace with very different scenes that are being enacted in other parts of the world. In 1940, the situation in Europe grew so threatening that Congress enacted the first peacetime conscription. Men were going into the service, and uh, we knew that one of these days it's going to happen. You can never forget that uh, where you were when, when Pearl Harbor occurred. Being only 11, of course, I didn't know how serious it was, but they were pretty upset on the radio. So I ran upstairs to tell my father that Pearl Harbor had been bombed, not knowing really what I was saying. Pearl Harbor? I was, I was uh, sitting on a neighbor's front porch listening to the Bears football game. I was in a soap opera. I was a gangster in soap. I was on NBC, 19th floor. Uh, I figured it may have been Ma Perkins, a woman in white. And sure enough, ooh, the, our soap opera was cut off. We all heard it and we listened to FDR. That since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war. And my brother walked in, having coming home from Mass, and he heard it and he says, I'll be the next one to go. 
the uh, Chicago Police Department rushed to protect the Michigan Avenue Bridge and other installations. There was an immediate concern. People were coming in and they were saying that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. And uh, you know where Pearl Harbor was. Nobody ever heard about it. I was there. And indeed he was. Mortimer Abramson's family moved from New York in 1927, and he spent his formative years in Chicago. In 1940, he found himself ripe for the draft and enlisted. I wanted to have my choice of uh, the branch of service, and I wanted the Marines. He was training on a ship near Hawaii on that morning of December 7, 1941. As uh, the bombs were being dropped on Pearl Harbor, the ship's gunnery officer ran through the marine compartment on the USS Northampton and said, men, this is the real thing. The war began for Mortimer Abramson and everyone else. He would soon serve with valor in 13 actions against the enemy and find the love of his life in Chicago. That part of his story later. I went in before the war. I went in in uh, March of 41. Mario Tonelli's story is typical of many Chicagoans at the time. My father came to America first and left my mom back home with a brother and a sister. And then after he got established here and got some money and went back and he brought them all back. He became a gifted high school athlete. One evening in his senior year, a priest came by his home accompanied by a football coach from Notre Dame who talked with young Mario. When he left, I would say my mother and father made the decision for me where I was going to go. They said it's a Catholic school, it's not far from here, and you, you know. He starred at Notre Dame and after graduation joined the Chicago Cardinals as a fullback. I was with the Cardinals one year. Then I went to the Army after that first year I was with them. Tonelli's wife moved in with his folks and he shipped out for the Philippines. When I heard about Pearl Harbor, I was at Clark Field and uh, and we were coming out of launch, there were about 54 planes up in the air coming in. But before we knew it, the bombs were starting to drop on. They started to hit, hit Clark Field. They damaged Clark Field pretty good. And then the Japanese attacked by land. And we fought for about 80 days before we surrendered. And every day got worse, less ammunition, less food, more people were getting sick. They were herded together by the Japanese and told to start walking. It would later be called the Bataan Death March. The entire Death March covered about 70 miles, and we did it in seven days. That's about 10, 10 miles a day, which really isn't much. But when you don't have water, you don't have food, and the hot sun, it's, it's a long way. And uh, with the fellows that were had malaria with beriberi, and all these different diseases, a, a lot of them couldn't, couldn't go on. And they just dropped. We'd pick them up and try to carry them, but, uh, and if they, if he left them there, they would get shot, they'd get bayoneted. I was sick, I had malaria, I had malaria a lot. A lot. And uh, I came down with the chills and the fevers and the sweats and everything, and we were losing 70 men a day there in the, in the hospital. In all, some 10,000 men died during the ordeal. Somehow, Mario Tonelli survived. Eventually, he and about 1,000 other Americans were put on a boat and sent to a prison camp in Japan to perform hard labor. As conditions worsened for Americans captured in the Philippines, Things turned ugly for Japanese Americans at home. One of them was Robert E. Moon, then of Los Angeles. On December 7, 1941, he was a student at UCLA. I was studying for a physics test Sunday, 
And on the radio, I heard the news about uh, the Japanese attacking Pearl Harbor. And that really surprised me. We had to take my parents down to the city hall and they had to answer a lot of questions, get fingerprinted. We lost our restaurant, yes, and we just had to evacuate. Some 120,000 Japanese Americans were relocated. The Imon family was sent to a center in Wyoming. We were in a concentration camp for all intents and purposes. They remained there for about two years, and then there was a change. They were asking people to leave camp to go out to the city and work or go to school, so we got our clearance and I left in uh, about April or May for Chicago. There were 20,000 Japanese Americans who were brought in from the detention camps in the desert and were brought into Chicago. Well, the reason I chose Chicago was my uh, sister was living out here and she already had a place to stay and she said, come on out, so I left came to Chicago. And when the people began to be shipped in here in, in uh, late 1942 in, in particular, there was some concern about how they would be accepted. When we first came in, they asked, are you an Eskimo? We said, no. And we said, I was Japanese American. And they didn't seem to have any prejudice. They wanted to uh, prevent the creation of what people referred to as little Tokyos. Uh, and so they were scattered on the north and south sides, uh, in kind of a linear pattern along Clark Street on the north side and, and a, a few other places. We were loyal. We are, I already registered for the draft. I never felt I had to prove to be that I was an American. And so in 1945, Robert E. Moon entered the United States Army and served his country. If Chicago's new Japanese population was accepted without prejudice, things were somewhat different in regard to the city's old and very large German community. People were very suspicious of anyone who was German. The Reverend Thomas Henry serves the St. Paul's United Church of Christ in the heart of what was once Chicago's north side German-American blue-collar neighborhood. He recently authored a book about the history of his church. There were federal agents who came and sat in on worship services here at St. Paul's Church. And they listened to make sure that, that nothing was being uh, preached from the pulpit against uh, the United States. The German Americans really were against the U.S. entering the war uh, because they feared that um, the young men, particularly who would be going from here and serving the armed forces, could well be fighting their relatives in Germany. Jewish Chicagoans were also concerned for their relatives in Europe but for a very different reason. The Jewish community was very aware of what was going on in Europe. I think if there is a myth, there is a, uh, around it is that America was ignorant of the Holocaust. That's not at all the case. I think what America wasn't aware of perhaps was the size of the tragedy that was going on. The Jewish community was very active, not only from general patriotic activities, uh, but also in trying to uh, rescue people, in trying to uh, keep the press aware of what was going on. And when called upon, Jewish Americans, as well as German Americans, didn't hesitate to fight. They still uh, were primarily Americans and saw themselves as Americans and uh, were very supportive of the, of the United States once the United States decided to enter the war. One man in the congregation who's still here today said that when he uh, enlisted uh, in the uh, U.S. Army, he was asked the question, you know, what is your allegiance? You are a German background, what is your allegiance? And he said simply, I am an American. And that was pretty clear. George Gutterly was born within walking distance of St. Paul's Church. My grandparents, uh, all four of them, came from, uh, from Germany. I enlisted in September of 42, and uh, I, was, I hadn't yet turned 20. My dad had a sign for me, because I wasn't, at that time, you had to be 21 to enlist. And uh, uh, mother wasn't very happy with my dad signing, but uh, dad said, what the heck, uh, he'll, he'll go down and enlist anyhow and lie about it. Gutterly joined the Army Air Corps and became a gunner on a B-17. Well, we, f we were uh, flying out of Foggia, Italy, a, a little town called San Severo, north of Foggia. And uh, I'm, I was shot down on my 13th mission. I bailed out at, uh, at an altitude of 24,500, and the tail gunner bailed out. 
uh, landed in a, in a lake. When I got down to the ground, there were about five or six people coming up the hill. I thought they were waving sticks at me, but they were shooting at me, so I didn't hang around to, to wait. I was shot on the 12th, and I wasn't captured until the 19th. I was captured on the Swiss-Austrian border. A German officer interrogated him. Gutterly gave only his name, rank, and serial number. He would get angry and pound on the table, and, and uh, he said to me, uh, Guderlei, Guderlei, that's a German name, isn't it? And I said, yeah. He said, your parents come from Germany? I said, no. Or were you in Germany? No. I said, your parents come from Germany? No. Your grandparents? I said, yeah. My grandparents were smart enough to get out of this friggin' country, and uh, I spent three days in solitaire. Wayland Buchholz also comes from a German heritage. Well, I grew up in Palmer Square. I went to school with Elaine Tech uh, for four years. The uh, last year, I enlisted into the Air Force. It was 1943. Buchholz also became a gunner and also found trouble in the skies over Europe. We flew 14 missions. On the 14th, we were shot, shot down. They were captured and soon found themselves in a prison camp in what is now Poland. It's a brand new camp. We slept in tents in that. And then something happened that would turn out to be very lucky for Wayland Buchholz. It came in the form of George Gutterly. After we got to this camp, we'd wander from one barracks to another, looking for familiar faces, guys that you flew with or people that you grew up with. And I went, in, went into the room and said, anybody from Chicago? And Buck said, yeah, I'm from Chicago. I said, where from? I'm from Palmer Square. He says, well, so am I. There, yeah, there. I said, what's your name? Buckholz. I said, oh, then you're, you're Wendell's brother. And I knew his, his older brother, and uh, we struck up a very close friendship after that. It was unbelievable. Two kids from the same Chicago neighborhood found each other in a prison camp that contained some 10,000 Allied airmen. It soon became apparent to them that there would be a change. They could hear the distant rumble of artillery. The Russian front was moving toward them. On the 6th of February, uh, we're told you're going to start marching. When we marched, got out of camp and started marching, we marched for 86 days and over six, six, I think it's 602 miles. And what I did was I put two pairs of socks on because I learned that playing basketball at Lane the coach always says, wear two pairs of socks so you, you won't get blisters. And that stuck in my mind. And that's what I did. I never got a blister on the march. This, this is my lane ring, and I had it all through POW camp. And I wear it today because when uh, fellows were so desperately ill and hungry on the march, the, they'd say, well, what can we... It's, it's the Germans say, well, you want some bread? Uh, what have you got to trade? A lot of the guys traded off their high school rings, and the German said to me, I'll give you two and a half loaves of bread for that ring. I said, after I'm dead, you can take it off of me, but I'm not gonna give it to you. It was just one of, it's just pure orneriness. I estimated that I was down to about 100 pounds. Yeah, he was ready to, ready to give up. I kept track, I think we had about two pounds of bread and about five pounds of potatoes for the three months that we were on the march. And, and we became desperately ill and we got to this one place where they had uh, what they called a sick barn. So one day I w walked into the, the sick barn and there's Buck. And uh, he was ready to give up. He, and I figured, gee, he, I've known this guy and he's like a kid brother to me because I'm three years older than him. And, and uh, so I figured, gee, I gotta do something to, to get some food for him. I don't know what you call those five gallon milk cans, you know, they had, and there was out in the courtyard. And George went out and, and got it. And walked out there, grabbed the can of cream in front of God and everybody. The German guard didn't pay attention to me. He could figure anybody who is gutsy enough to go out and, and do that must belong there. And I took it into the sick barn. It really kept the, the coals burning on me and, and working on this here. Because you're so weak, you couldn't walk. And uh, Buck uh, later on said that uh, if he hadn't had that cream, he wouldn't have made it. We estimate about 1,500 uh, that died in the march. They were liberated on May 2nd or 3rd up near Hamburg. I, 
I missed the last 130 miles because I escaped. Not everyone was so lucky, like the tail gunner who bailed out with George Gutterly and drowned in a lake. Mitchell Pecos was a Polish-American kid from south suburban Harvey, his younger brother, Bill. There are eight kids in my family, and you can probably see the one photograph that I have, and I'm the one that's on the very base, and the boy that's right up on the top was the uh, brother of question. And as I remembered him when I was four years of age, when he came home from leave, um, he was hiding, you know, behind the door. And I quickly ran in, where's Mitchell? You know, like that, which is a normal thing to do for a youngster. And then I found him and he lifted me up to the uh, sky and down. He was late teens. I think he probably would have to be late teens, you know, at that time. You have to remember what the crew of the airplane, the B-17, was like. Uh, they were late teenagers and early 20. The news of his death was a very interesting thing because it left a lot of feelings within me because my mother was not willing to accept, you know, that he was dead. And there was some feeling that he may be wandering off someplace in Europe. My brother now is buried in St. of Old, um, and that's a what's known as the Lorraine American Cemetery, and that's located in France. And I happened to go there uh, multi-times, and um, that's another ex uh, emotional time, too. <laughs> and, well, anyway. About 400,000 uh, Chicagoans went to war. It seemed everybody in the neighborhood. My Uncle Frankie, he was 29 years old, and he went into the service May 31st, 1943. That was his birthday. My cousin Jackie went into the service. on Sangamon Street and he was teaching us all how to march back and forth across the front yard and you can see the look on my grandfather's face, the strain. He had just lost his son and this was his son's boy, his oldest boy that was going into war. The first part of the war did not go all that well for the United States. There was some fear that we were going to, uh, uh, to lose it. I'd come home from school and I remember my grandmother sitting in this rose-colored chair in the living room saying her rosary for all the soldiers. There were a lot of rumors that uh, the Germans had long-range bombers, that they could fly over the Arctic and could hit uh, uh, Chicago. My dad was the um, air raid captain. He was the captain of our block and it was a major thing. Everybody had to pull their shades down and you know he would look out to make sure all the shades were down in the block. And we were so proud that he was the ERA captain. And we, we were afraid the war was going to come to 78th and Sangamon Street or into the neighborhood when we had those drills. There was no way that you could uh, hide from the war. It affected you whether you wanted to or not. People participated in many ways. They bought heroic amounts of bonds. They participated uh, through uh, scrap drives, through trying to uh, collect uh, uh, aluminum and rubber and paper for the war effort. We had paper drives at Leo. And of course at home we saved um, the grease. The collection of fat was an idea, supposedly, of Mayor Kelly, who um, had read that fat could be converted into nitroglycerin. 
Victory Gardens were another very important part of this process. They were communal in a lot of ways. People were encouraged to farm in large mass plots as well as putting things in their backyards. Portions of the Chicago parks were plowed over for uh, uh, Victory Garden purposes. We just went down there with seeds, put them in the backyard, dug it up, and we'd have enough every night. I was uh, president of the Clean Plate Club of Glencoe. I re do remember the rationing, though. We had to stand in line for hours to get meat, and, and you had the rationing cards. Things like tires and gasoline were also a, a ration. I gave up drinking sugar in my coffee at that time, so my mother could have my uh, sugar to, cook, to bake with. She was a great baker. By the way, there was very little black, there was black marketeering, but surprisingly little because the people more or less pitched in. They knew this was an all-around effort over and beyond. There was no little military adventure. I remember there was shoe rationing. There was new mode hosiery, 78th and Halstead, and the women would be lined up for blocks trying to get a pair of nylons. Live chickens were not rationed, so that you, uh, we'd get uh, live chickens were not very expensive. John Long went into the Army in 1942. He was stationed in Chicago and trained to become a doctor. They paid uh, for my books, paid my tuition, and gave me an allowance uh, to live on. I think they seventy-five dollars a month. In those days, it was pretty good. And at the end of your internship, then you were obligated to go in the uh, service as a um, first lieutenant. Uh, and in medical school, the first year we had the physiology course. I had wonderful big bullfrogs that we had to uh, work with. At the end of the day, my uh, partner in the uh, lab would cut the legs off of all the frogs and skin them out. We'd take them home. We had 160 in the class, so we had under 160 pair of frog legs. And uh, we'd cook those up, and we could go down, and you could buy from Wee Bolts, Wee Bolt Wonder Beer, which was uh, 20 cents a bottle. And uh, we would have big uh, parties of the medical students would come over. And every Saturday, we had to uh, have close order drill. And sometimes if an exam was coming up, we'd try to skip it. But they took roll call, and if they caught you, they put you over in the YMCA, which was on uh, Congress Street and uh, Wood Street. There was a big YMCA, and it was occupied by the captured uh, German prisoners. So they, they'd put you to work in the kitchen. But the prisoners did all the work, and it really wasn't bad duty, and you got a good meal while you were there. There were several hundred uh, German prisoners of war who were brought into the Chicago area in large part to help fill the uh, tremendous labor shortage that uh, existed here. There was a very dramatic turnaround in the uh, Chicago status as an industrial center in the war. By the end of the war, over 1,400 Chicago factories were producing war goods. If you owned a factory that, uh, well, let's say made uh, um, insoles, I'm thinking of the Dr. Scholl company that made various kinds of things that you put in your shoes. Uh, this company uh, was suddenly banned from producing their regular product, so uh, they were put to work uh, making parachutes instead. It happened all over Chicago. Suddenly a place like Helene Curtis was no longer manufacturing products for women. Co-founder Gerald Gidwitz. We made bomb release mechanisms, we made radar for the Navy, we made a small radar for the Air Force, we made uh, gun turrets with 30 caliber machine guns on them. It was clear that the uh, industrial expansion soon depleted the uh, ranks of the unemployed in terms of, of the usual laborers, particularly white males. And so what you did was to ex find ways to expand that workforce. Some 60,000 African Americans came from the South to Chicago to work in the war factories and became a very important part of the uh, war effort. I knew there were a lot of women working in factories like Rosie the Riveter, uh, my neighbor now, worked at the uh, Ford plant, which was then an aviation plant. Yolanda Hall was one of them as well. Her parents were Hungarian immigrants who arrived in Chicago in the depths of the Depression. They found work and raised and educated their children. Yolanda and her husband Chuck were married just before the war broke out. We discussed about the importance of winning the war against uh, the Axis and defeating fascism. 
and we agreed since we had no children and he had the experience of fighting in Spain that he should enlist. And so a week or so after Pearl Harbor, he enlisted and he left on January 12, 1942. I enrolled at Lane uh, Tech and uh, took a course to become a tool grinder, which was a skilled job. She enrolled because she wanted to do her part in the war effort. Soon she found work at Bendix Aviation in the West Town neighborhood. And I became the first woman to uh, go in the tool room. The maintenance department and the tool room were men's preserves. And they would do things like hide tools on me and uh, give me misleading information. And then at night, my father and my uncle would help me read blueprints, and I would get sort of extra coaching from them. So um, it wasn't before long that I could do my job pretty well. And I must say that the guys in the tool room turned around quite a bit. And uh, eventually, they voted for me for uh, steward of the department. And later, I became president of the union local. So uh, the guys were. You know, they were willing to learn. Before it was over, some 40 to 50,000 Chicago women went into the factories. Well, Chicago functioned as a military hub of very great importance during the war. First of all, it was a transportation crossroads, uh, but it uh, was also, because of its transportation location, a major training ground for uh, uh, military personnel. Uh, Fort Sheridan was uh, upgraded as a, a, a major processing center, Great Lakes Naval Training Center, uh, gave basic training to one-third of the United States Navy that served in the war. Uh, the University of Chicago uh, trained uh, meteorologists, uh, uh, language experts. Uh, Northwestern University's uh, Naval Midshipman Program was the largest in the United States. And uh, such people as Johnny Carson and John F. Kennedy did their uh, officer training work at, at the Northwestern Center. Well, probably the most interesting story uh, about the military training in the war involved training pilots. The problem was that they needed uh, to find some way to simulate the conditions of aircraft carriers. Uh, and the only way to do that was to buy two old lake steamers, which were transformed into aircraft carriers and floated them out in the uh, lake. And somewhere over 20,000 pilots were trained for the Naval Air Corps uh, out of those facilities. You had USOs uh, in the Chicago area, but the service bin centers that were operated by the Park District were really more important in terms of the number of military personnel who were served. I ran the center at the, at the Lincoln Park Center, so it was a very active time in my life. There wasn't a thing that the servicemen couldn't have. They had entertainment tickets anywhere they wanted to go. They had food, they had lodging. Some of my girlfriends and I would bake cakes and go down to the USO and dance with the fellows or help them write letters, things like that. But the kids from small towns were really the ones that appreciated what they found in Chicago. The center in the auditorium theater by the end of the war had served nearly 25 million meals to military people passing through. People got together, it was united everyone. Chicago was one family. There was no question that, that uh, the country was united. 
And that's because it was serious business, very serious. One thing is that the boy across the street was killed, and I'd never known anyone who died, much less being killed in the war. Everyone had a flag in the window. Well, you had a basic flag that had a blue star on it for each person from the family who was in the service, and of course some families had multiple stars. Uh, the flag that no one wanted in their window was the gold star because it meant a casualty. Well, this they put on the light pole, right on the corner, see, because we lived on the corner. And uh, if it was right when they put it up, or a day or so, whatever, whatever it was, those two soldiers came, and I think, and they shot off a couple of rounds, you know, like a ceremony. Leonard Wire's brother Ellis died during the invasion of Anzio in Italy. He was an Irish kid who had grown up in a family of nine children, raised by a widowed mother. My brother Ellis enlisted, and my mother didn't want him to because he was the last one home besides me. You know, she told him to stay home, but he wanted to go and serve his country. Well, got the news, and I know she's all broken up over it. I remember my mom when she was laying in bed, crying away, and kind of got killed and had the priest over praying for her and all. You know, mothers don't raise kids for stuff like that. In his yearbook in the, for school, somebody wrote it to a guy that could fight with no hands. I mean, he was, I'm sorry. He was, that's guy. Human drama was being played out on the south side of the city at the campus of the University of Chicago. Chicago was, of course, the birthplace of the uh, atomic age. It was called the Manhattan Project, and one of the young scientists recruited from the east was John Simpson. In Chicago, uh, almost immediately, I was immersed in the problems of the uh, war effort, and uh, here uh, we were principally focused on the development of plutonium as a means to uh, developing a bomb. Uh, I had a small share in the effort. The people who worked on the project couldn't tell their wives about it. It was an elite group of 40 physicists working under the direction of a brilliant Italian named Enrico Fermi. When it came time to finish the first chain reaction, no one knew really whether it was a going to be uh, how fast it would go critical, although Enrico Fermi actually made very good estimates of, uh, of the timing and the growth rate. But not knowing what would happen in Hyde Park, the security quietly posted uh, radiation buttons in the trees, you know, just in case so we'd have a record of what was there if something happened. Well, finally, on uh, December 2nd, 1942, the chain reaction took place. This whole thing went through without uh, uh, a failure. It was a beautiful experiment. And then someone was designated to send a telegram to President Roosevelt saying the Italian navigator has landed in the New World, which was, uh, a, in, co in its, its own form, a code uh, to inform Washington that they had indeed uh, pulled off the first sustained nuclear reaction. It meant that a weapon could be developed to end the war, but that work lay ahead. In the meantime, the conflict continued, and Chicagoans served. People of all races, people like Bill Thompson. I enlisted because I wanted to really I wanted to fly. I wanted to become a fighter pilot or a bomber pilot or whatever. And um, the only place I could get any advanced flying would have been right here in Chicago at the Harlem Airport. Well, after I finished my training, they sent me down to Tuskegee. And uh, there wasn't anything down there but 13 other cadets, flying cadets that were learning to fly. But even here, among those 13 that were down there, I would say about 60 or 70 percent of those guys already had pilot's license too, because they were all out of colleges that taught aviation. 
about 90% of the black enlisted men were college graduates. Some of them had masters, and we had one or two that had doctor's degrees. That's a fact. And the white enlisted personnel was not uh, as astute educationally as our black enlisted personnel. These guys hadn't probably been to high school even. So they said, oh, you guys uh, coming into the Air Corps? Yeah. Well, what are you guys going to be? Are you going to be the night fighters? We couldn't get angry with them because this is the best that they could do. They weren't too bright. I was an Army officer for a single squadron. I had 28 airplanes, and uh, my job was to make certain that airplane was ready for action. And the fighters were badly needed. The um, bombers were losing almost 600, 600 uh, crew members a day being wiped out. These weren't black foes, these were white foes flying the bombers. And so the Tuskegee Airmen, as they came to be known, were sent out to protect the bombers. We'd rendezvous with them, take them to the target, and bring them home for a while there. We shot down as many as 12 and 13 airplanes a day. We were interested in two things. First of all, they wanted to fly. The second thing, we were hoping that through our achievement, we'd be able to come back to America, and America would say, welcome home, fellas, you know, one of those things. But it wasn't like that. When we got home, they, the prisoners that were here were getting better treatment than we were. Dempsey Travis had a similar experience in the service, only worse. He had been a musician in Chicago. He was drafted and sent to a camp in Ohio, which was, of course, segregated. Uh, like the cities, uh, the Army had its own ghettos. And of course, we had a black ghetto where all the soldiers were housed. Uh, we didn't have a theater. Uh, we didn't have a post exchange. We didn't have anything. Those amenities were on the white side of the camp. The German prisoners could go to the theaters. German prisoners could go to the post exchange. German prisoners could go to the service club. And when we got on the bus, to go to town, German prisoners rode in the front of the bus, and we rode in the back. Finally, a tent was put up so that off-duty black soldiers could see movies. It was July 11th, 1943, that I went to see Weathering Heights. And uh, when I came out, I was shot three times. It happened because, unbeknownst to the men watching the movie, there had been a racial incident in another part of the camp. A caravan of uh, uh, trucks moved in, surrounded the area, and like the snap of your finger, turned out all the lights and just started firing. Firing at will. Men were dropping like flies. I was shot down like a dog by white troops in, wearing the same uniform that I was wearing who obviously had no compassion for black people at all. Travis recovered from his wounds and went on to the rank of sergeant. Uh, my father, uh, when I was promoted to sergeant, uh, you would have thought that I was General MacArthur. He was so proud. Uh, he said, look at those stripes on my sons. You know, look at him, look at him, he's a smart boy, you know. And so Travis found an iota of pride in his Army experience. But does he harbor bitterness as well? Oh, no. No, no, I'm not bitter. Uh, I don't have time. I don't have time. And I, I, I just believe that bitterness destroys you. Margaret Abramson, a member of another minority in the service, women, had a very different experience. I'm a pioneer Chicagoan, and as they used to say, I loved every one of its dirty streets and alleys. I had worked with the USO for a year, and I had known what goes on with the Navy because we had this big Navy base at Navy Pier. I enlisted in December of 1942. The waves had just started because they, they were only uh, uh, organized about in July of 42. I was prepared for it because I had been 
going to nun school, wearing a, a blue uniform for four years, having discipline and obeying orders, and the Navy wasn't much different than uh, the, what I was accustomed to. She was assigned to the Charleston, South Carolina yard and put in charge of Navy relief. And if we had a casualty, I would drive out in the country of, of South Carolina and visit the family and let them know that the Navy was there to help. I was a commissioned an ensign. I was discharged as a full lieutenant, two stripes. We were Navy. We were not uh, uh, Girl Scouts. We, were, we had the same rank as men. And although I didn't do battle with the enemy, I, I relieved a man for sea duty. Somebody, somebody had to go to war because I took a desk job. I mean, wars are generally fought by the young, and uh, uh, this was no exception. One of them was Bill Cullerton. Uh, like any young fellow, at that time I guess I was 18. I was determined to get into the Air Force. And eventually, a couple of months later, I got called in. His sweetheart lived in Oak Park, Elaine Stephen. All of her close friends, including Bill, called her by her nickname, Steve. Bill Collard and I started going together when we both sophomores in high school. I don't remember what I said to her other than um, that I'll be back. Well, Bill was always the kind that would get into the fight, I think. You know, if something was going on or somebody needed him, I think he would be there. He became a fighter pilot and was sent to Europe. Our group went overseas as the first P-51 trained group. I just saw a picture of the plane and it was Miss Steve, you know, and then from then on he had a few other planes and it was always Miss Steve. We thought we'd whip him in no time. We got over there, we found out it was a little different. We were up against uh, some guys, uh, the Germans had been shooting down the poor Poles since 1939. So they had a lot of experienced pilots in the air. And then when he came back from his first tour duty, that was in at Christmas time, and uh, he gave me a ring. Then he went back overseas. Bill proved to be a skilled fighter pilot and quickly became an ace. An ace means that you have had five aerial victories. Well, I shot down six in the air, and I destroyed 21 on the ground, straight he began to feel some guilt about his engagement to Steve. I was mature enough then to know that the, that, uh, the chances are of getting through a second tour are pretty tough. And I didn't get through the second tour, I got shot down. At the time I got hit, I was probably only six or eight feet off the ground. So uh, when I figured I was close enough, <laughs> high enough, I bailed, I got out of there. Because that thing was gonna blow any minute. Uh, I finally stopped, unhooked my chute. I got into the uh, night very well. I spent the next uh, several nights uh, moving uh, across uh, southern Germany. I went to the Fenwick High School and uh, uh, I still credit uh, the, the inspiration of a high school coach named Tony Lawless. The inspiration that he gave me uh, helped me through a lot of cold nights when I was evading in Germany. He always had a sign in his office that it's uh, not the dog in the fight, but the fight in the dog. He made his way toward the advancing American army. But then, in a small woods, he stumbled upon a group of retreating German soldiers. The, the leader, probably a lieutenant or whatever, uh, he took my gun, a 45, and he did speak a little English. He put the gun in my belly and he said, for you, the war is over, and he shot me. The first telegram was that Bill was missing in action, which was, of course, uh, oh, just terrible for everybody, and his folks were terribly upset. I remember coming to on a hospital, in a hospital room, and uh, there was a fellow leaning over me, and uh, I was Catholic, am Catholic. I was wearing a crucifix. Well, this fellow spoke a little bit of English, the doctor. He was, as it turned out, not only the doctor, but he was a Jewish fellow. He said, uh, there are no priests here. 
I said, well, I understand that. He said, uh, you're shot in the liver and you're gonna die. You're bleeding to death. I didn't believe him and I knew I wasn't dying. Cullerton was right, but the hospital was run by the German military, which left him still in grave danger. Then, in the dark of one night, the doctor helped him escape. I was wounded pretty bad and uh, couldn't get around very well. So I worked my way to the edge of town. I found a culvert and I decided then I'm, I'm gonna spend the war here. And I got under the culvert and pretty soon I can hear the American tanks coming and hear them coming. They established right away that I was an American and I was wounded. They were ecstatic. They found, you know, they were actually liberated a guy. They rescued me. He had been shot down, he had been critically wounded, but he came home. I love Chicago. I did then, and I do today even more. Um, when you talk about coming home, it's a true homecoming. It was really a homecoming. Well, of course, it was absolutely wonderful. You know, I just, we all were broken up, and his parents were there too, and his sister. And it was just a wonderful time. I got home, uh, couldn't wait to see Steve. And uh, as soon as we got together, I found out that uh, we're gonna get married in a couple weeks. So she locked me in a closet for two weeks, wouldn't let me out, and we got married. <laughs> the war caused Jack Hughes and his sweetheart Rita McHenry to hurry their wedding plans. They decided to be married in Evanston before he joined the Air Corps. During the time he trained to become a B-17 pilot, Rita became pregnant. Then, it was time for Jack's last visit home. When well, it came the last call for the train, we were lingering and I gave the hugs to everybody and particularly to Rita. And because you know, she was pretty pregnant and it looked, I was going to miss the birth. And I was pretty sad. And I said, no, this is the last kiss. When I walked down that ramp, You'll all be here. I ain't going to turn around. That's afraid to. But there would be one more goodbye. His base was in Nebraska. He had been assigned to go to England. It meant he could fly over Chicago on his way. He called Rita at home. I should come over to your house in Evanston at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I said, that's what I'm aiming for. By the time I got down to Central Street and Prospect Avenue where they live, Right on the treetops. Right on the treetops. As I got up there where everybody could see me, and you just did what pilots always did. You waggled your wings. I kept waggling until I was out of sight. And that was a goodbye. I flew uh, 10 missions uh, over Germany. And uh, we had a few incidents. On his fifth mission, his bomber was badly hit with flak. So we decided that uh, there was just no sense of flying an airplane that was going to maybe explode. We didn't know. So the best way to put the fire out was to ditch it. So we ditched. Into the North Sea. The next day, the, the high-speed launches found us, took us into northern England. So much for that. It was fine. We got back to the base. We got a five-day ditching leave in London, and then you're back to duty. On his 10th mission, they were hit again, this time over France. The crew bailed out. I free fell all the way from the 22,000 down to about 1,500,000 feet. It was pretty quick, because after I pulled the chute, I hit the ground. That was close enough. They were rescued and hidden by the French resistance, who got them to the Pyrenees and an escape route to Spain. And then we walked 25 miles inland, and we climbed over the Pyrenees. My foot. Eventually, Jack Hughes made it back to England and the United States. I said in the telegram, you are invited to a homecoming party at Chicago Municipal Airport, 5.05 p.m. tomorrow. They were all there. I mean, the first time I fed the baby, I held her, held her, held her in my arms. Well, it just 
You come back from the dead and here all of a sudden you've got new life in your hands. It's, it's quite an experience. Jack Hughes and his beloved wife Rita were married for 56 years. She died in December of 96. Rita was a great religious woman and while I was overseas, maybe after I got shot down the first time, she made a retreat at St. Athanasius Church, Novena, to St. Jude. And that day she promised St. Jude that if I could come home, she would say a rosary the rest of her life. And never missed. Over 60,000 times. And that's one of the nice memories I have. You'd be so nice to come home to You'd be so nice by the fire While the breeze on high sang a lullaby You'd be all that I could desire there were a lot of, of people who lied about their age and dropped out of high school and went off into the military, actually quite sizable numbers. Bob McGuigan was one of them. His childhood sweetheart was Gloria Essig. Bob and I were dating at the time. Uh, he told me that he had enlisted and that he was going to be gone. And could he write to me? I knew he was going to be going to the Pacific because that's where he was in San Diego. And uh, I knew the war was really accelerated there. He became a gunner's mate and was assigned to the heavy cruiser, the USS Indianapolis. He and his shipmates took part in many battles. What Gloria didn't know, what virtually no one knew, was that Bob's ship was assigned to carry two atomic bombs to a remote island in the Pacific, a base for US B-29s. A young Chicago pilot was there, Fred Olivi. I grew up on 111th and Langley, not too far from the, the gate, one of the gates of the Pullman shop. And uh, my uncle had an Italian restaurant in the basement of the house that he uh, uh, owned at the time. As a kid, Fred read every aviation magazine he could get hold of. It was natural that he would enlist in the Army Air Corps. He completed his training as a B-29 pilot in 1944. I got sent to the South Pacific. I ended up being one of the co-pilots on, on the atomic missions. Olivi and the entire crew had known for some time what they were about to do. They were made even more aware when Hiroshima was destroyed. This was the second bombing, and we were ordered and we were briefed that we were supposed to drop visually only with the Norton bomb site. And uh, so we immediately started to look for a hole in the clouds. They found it over Nagasaki, a small one. The bombardier made the most of it. So he had 45 seconds to set up the bomb site. He killed the drift and made sure that we were on course. And in the 45 seconds, he set that up and we dropped the bomb. And I remember we were in bright sunlight. And when the bomb exploded, it was a bright bluish light that filled the entire uh, aircraft. And when we looked down, the, the entire city was covered with dust and smoke. And there were little fires that were breaking out all over that we could see. So then, of course, out of the center of, of the uh, of the city came the telltale mushroom cloud that, that is associated with the atomic bombings. But I'll never forget uh, uh, the, uh, the cloud itself because it was such a, a memorable thing that, again, I'll never forget it. Neither will Mario Tonelli, the former Chicago athlete who survived the Bataan Death March. When we were in prison camp, the Japanese tried to tell us what, what something about this thing that took everything, just burned everything out, you know. We thought they were reading Buck Roger books. And the next day they started to drop food to us in 55-gallon drums. When the war was over, we had such a big celebration. We got some toilet paper and threw, you know, on the street and had celebrating the end of the war. The downtown area was just loaded with people, wall to wall people. But there never was a glass broken, a door front broken, or anything. I was just glad the war was over with. That was the end of all of those sort of frightening things that had been going on. So two of us girls were Catholics, so we went to church. 
and we came back from church and the other two girls were in their room and they're crying and I said uh, you know what's the matter did something happen to one of their family or something and they hand me the Tribune and it said you know the, that the victory over Japan but in the one column it said the USS Indianapolis sunk 100% casualties. But fortunately, the word casualty does not necessarily mean dead, and Bob McGuigan wasn't. But the war was not over for him. On its return run from delivering the bomb, the Indianapolis and her crew had run into hell. We were hit by uh, three torpedoes, so everybody getting off the ship, wherever they got off or if they were blown off, they were quite a distance apart. Survivors swam toward each other. We put the wounded in the center and the guys that didn't have life jacket. And then their worst fears came true. They began to get picked off one by one. We had sharks every night. Anybody would, that would, they'd grab your legs and bite your legs. And maybe it was like the guy that I tried to wake up next to me, he just turned over edge. When I tried to wake him up, and there was no bottom there. Kept myself in a cannonball. I never looked into the water because every one of them guys that looked in the water went nuts. Went crazy over the sharks. About the fourth day, a B-17 came flying over and threw out some ramps. I told the guys in the group I was going to swim for that life jacket, my friend. There was a uh, 880 people were lost. 317 of us lived to be picked up. It is estimated that by the end of the war, the average Chicago block had seven people in the service. Now, most were coming home. When you came towards the harbor, you could see that Statue of Liberty there. I tell you, that's a sight to behold. When I got down, got down to the gangplank in New York, I kissed the ground. Let me tell you something, the flag is a symbol of freedom. And I remember when I first saw it, I started to cry, you know. I took the, uh, the North Shore Line onto the elevated uh, train and, and came home on a streetcar. I guess the old man uh, almost passed out, you know, when he saw me. They were home. And that was good. But was it the good war? Well, that's ironic. You notice in my book, I have it in quotation marks, the good war, because the adjective good and the noun war don't match. Even World War II, which if ever there was a just war, if ever there was one, I don't think there is one, but if there was one, it would be World War II. Well, I think it was the good war because it was also, in a sense, the feel-good war. Uh, because people had an identifiable enemy, uh, there was a, a, our enemies. It was very clear uh, in terms of our objectives, our goals. Uh, I think it had long-term impacts for things like civil rights. Many African Americans were very incensed by their treatment, often in the military. You know, it's the old question of uh, uh, when you've gone away and you've thought about it and you come back, things can never be the same. And I think that was very much the case of the war. Dempsey Travis went on to become a real estate developer, mortgage banker, best-selling author, and philanthropist. But it took the government some 50 years to even acknowledge that Travis had been shot by troops of his own army. He recently received a disability check for $70,000. John Simpson, who worked on the Manhattan Project, remained at the University of Chicago, teaching physics, and tirelessly pursued the peaceful use of atomic energy. John Long, sent to medical school by the Army, became a revered Chicago obstetrician, and during his career delivered some 12,000 babies. Mario Tonelli, survivor of the Bataan Death March, came home to play one more season for the Chicago Cardinals, and then went on to a successful career in business and government. Fred Olivi, who bombed Nagasaki, 
became a commissioner of the city of Chicago and remained in the Air Force Reserve long enough to reach the rank of lieutenant colonel. George Gutterly, who saved Wayland Buckholt's life, stood up at his wedding. They remain fast friends to this day. Gutterly eventually became executive director of the Illinois Tollway Commission. Mortimer Abramson, the Marine who was at Pearl Harbor, met a pretty wave on the railroad platform at Great Lakes. And even though she outranked him, he fell in love. He and Margaret have been married now some 50 years. After the war, Tuskegee Airman Bill Thompson hoped to become a commercial pilot. But because of prejudice, those doors were closed to him. So he and his wife Vera helped others spread their wings. They taught in the Chicago public schools for a combined 50 plus years. Bill Cullerton founded a large and successful sporting goods sales organization. Unfortunately, he has always suffered from the gunshot wound to his stomach. Bob and Gloria McWigan had two sons who served in the military. Their life has been happy and peaceful, except Bob has never really slept well since the war. He dreams of sharks. And all of the Chicagoans who took part in World War II have feelings about what they lived through. Yes, I'm proud to have served. I, um, I would do it again. We were looked upon as being quite favored among our own people because they were very proud of us. We were proud of ourselves. And I think as women, uh, we made a, a particular contribution on the home front that can't be uh, negated. I think it's important. When I took that uniform off, I went back to civilian life, but I really never took the uniform off. I really, I still wear the shadow of the uniform. I loved it. I loved the service. I think the, the most meaningful thing to me was the fact that we had won the war and we had kept the war uh, away from our shores. World War II raged from 1939 to 1945. It was fought primarily in Europe and the South Pacific. Yet Chicago was at the center of the fight and so were her people. Till then, my darling, please wait for me. Till then, no matter when it will be one day, I know I'll be back again. Please wait till then.